Hello. I'm Angela Gia Kim, and I'm a former concert pianist turned eco-entrepreneur. And when I was growing up, I learned how to, as a concert pianist, color perfectly within the lines. But I understood very quickly that when you get on stage, the magic takes over when you take those risks, when you're able to really connect with the audience. And that served me well as I launched Oma Roman Co., my organic skincare line, which is made fresh every morning in the Hudson Valley. And I launched two spas, a Saver Spa, which is in the West Village and in Woodstock, New York. And I have a women's empowerment organization called Savor the Success. And one of my favorite sayings, which I think you will appreciate, is never beg for forgiveness, never ask for permission. And so if you are a risk taker and you are creative and you want to express that through your own leadership and within cultivate, cultivating it within your team, you've come to the right panel. So I would like to introduce our panelists for today. And we are short one person, so I would love to ask, if there is a male representative here, if you are a rebel rouser, if you could just impromptu come on up to the stage and you'll be part of the panel because Pete could not make it. So we're gonna start off by creating some noise in the room already. Yay, come on up, okay. <laughs> and always give Always give credit where credit is due. That idea came for our first Rebel Rouser, Nicole Yershon, come on up. She is the Director of Innovative Solutions of Ogilvy Labs. I'm sure you've heard of Ogilvy. Yes. Okay, so do you want to sit far yep. away from me? Okay, great. I'm, I'm only <laughs> following form for that. Okay, great. Bisila Bokoko. She is an award-winning businesswoman who just flew, flew in from Turkey. Uh, she's a speaker and philanthropist. Welcome. And I love this next name, Jimmy Stone. Isn't that a good name? I think you have some fans. Um, he's the executive creative, creative director at Edelman. And you know, I don't know your name, but welcome on the stage. Why don't you introduce yourself? <laughs> I'm Matt Eastwood, um, Global Chief Creative Officer, Creative Officer just, at J. Walter Thompson. Yeah, it's just that. All right, so um, why do I have this? Can you hear me? Okay, hello, wonderful. Hello, hello, hello. So the thing about this panel that you're going to love is everyone, except for Matt, who has just ruined it for us, has an amazing accent. So we're in for a yeah, lot of I colorful times. Australian. Australian. Oh, you're from Australia? Yeah. You've done well. Yeah, so <laughs> accent okay. lives on. All right, so what I'd love to do is ask everyone, starting from Nicole, to share two to three sentences about your background and maybe one highlight in your career where being a rebel rouser really served you well. Oh, gosh. Um, there's too many highlights. Um, <laughs> You've got to just choose one. So I... I I have been in advertising for 27 years, and I started my life with Dave Trott, um, who's creative director, so I was working with Cindy Gallup um, all those kind of years ago, and um, she won't thank me for that, actually, saying those years, but anyway. So we, they seem to employ people like us, and so therefore Cindy and myself and everyone that was there at that time, and then at my next agency, Simons Palmer, which is run uh, by Carl Johnson, who runs Anomaly, all of those two agencies seem to employ people like us, people that didn't ask for permission, people that, um, I mean, Dave Trott always used to call me an irresistible force against immovable objects. Because once you're on that road of knowing a, a, a route to go, um, you don't listen to anything either side, you just kind of get to that very end because it's very easy for people to say no. So um, he was a really good mentor for me um, to begin with. So I think it's really good to have someone uh, when you first start off and you're young who gives you permission to um, fuck up and, because that's how you learn. So perfect is overrated. I think fucking up all the time is a really good thing because you learn those mistakes and then you don't do it again. If you try and keep it perfect, you then start to get frightened. And you don't want to be frightened because you need to have enough self-esteem to be able to keep pushing forward in not asking for permission. And you need to kind of know what's the worst that can happen. 
So and Nicole, I think you bring up a really great point about cultivating a team and being a mentor for the mentees and, and encouraging yeah. them to bring out that risk factor and yeah. to continue to, to be creative. To just creative. not be frightened. And we'll get to that in just a moment because that's such an important question. Okay, so Vasila. Hi, everyone. Um, I could not agree more with Nicole what she says that you should not try to be perfect because I think that you learn through your process. I was born in Spain. I am, my family is from Africa, and I always realized that I have to be where I wanted to be. So I don't need to ask for permission, and I don't have to label myself like being a woman or being African to do something. You just have to do it and feel it. And I think in my childhood, I have great inspiration and, uh, through my parents that they never let me to allow people to label me somehow because I was the only child in the school, in the, in, in the college in Spain, growing up like an African descent. And then I took the position to be the Spain-US Chamber of Commerce Executive Director. And I was the first woman, I was 30 years old, and also I was uh, African. So this was to represent Spain with my profile. It was a challenge because, you know, a lot of people were thinking, is she really represent Spain, <laughs> the Spanish spirit? But what I did is to just exactly that, don't ask for permission and try to be creative and do things different and uh, market Spain in a different way. So I remember the first time I was in a board of directors and I have 40 men looking at me, telling me what is the plan because we have such an amount of money and we want to increase our revenue and to um, make Spain more visible in the country. That was 15 years ago. And it was, I, I realized that we were doing things in a very boring way. So we had to do completely out of the box. So what I did is to take different industries to represent Spain, industries like fashion, culture. So we did different things with museums, with um, food, with wines. So it was the time that all it was about the food from Spain. We have the best chef in, in the world. It was the Spaniards. So we, we went around the world to marketing our food. And this is how we make Spain um, known around the world. So this probably is one of the things that uh, I was very proud of. And before we were speaking, before we came up, and you said something very interesting, which I'm going to pick your brain on. You said that um, for the Barcelona Opera House, you do a campaign for them, and you just shake it up, and you do things crazy is exactly how you said it. So we're going to ask you about that in just a second as well. Jimmy. Yep. So actually, my name is James Henry Nigglestone III, but I, can, I am a, a salsa dancer, born in Caracas, Venezuela. Uh, so it's just a little bit of a mess. Did you but, say you were a salsa dancer? Yeah, I'm a salsa teacher. We'll have so to get the DJ to play some <laughs> Spanish music and we'll salsa it Nobody up knows you. that, but I can teach you too. <laughs> uh, so I, I guess, uh, you know, one of the, I have always looked at nature as kind of like the inspiration for everything. And I remember uh, living in Caracas, and it, well, and it, it's uh, like 40 minutes from Caracas when I was a kid, and saw this image that has always in, in, inspired me for many, many years to recently, relatively recently, I understood what it was. So it was this little bird getting leaping for the first time from the nest. I don't know if you have had that chance of seeing that. In that time, I thought that this bird, it was just sloppy coming down. Till in the end, he just basically, or he or she, uh, basically, um, uh, took flight. So that uh, image strikes me for many, 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 many long time till I finally realized that that bird was actually leaping, uh, which was almost like life, you know, going into it without knowing absolutely anything and trying to go down and try to just open your wings and do that. And that is really how I realized that that's what life really is. Every day is leaping. Every day is an ability to do something. From that moment on, I have never been somehow uh, in any position. I, everything is white on white, and I have never been comfortable any, anymore. I'm uncomfortable every day. And that's great. I think that's the secret to stretching yourself and coming up with something that stands out and that's extraordinary. Um, OK, so Matt from Australia. 
Where do you live now, Matt? I live in New York, so uh, although mostly... You on... do have a lovely accent, I yeah. apologize. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I've lived in New York now for on and off for 10 years, so I have a little bit of a twang when I'm in the back of a taxi asking for directions, but that's about it. <laughs> um, I mean, I think the idea of uh, sort of not waiting for permission is something that uh, I've kind of, I guess, used throughout my whole career. and. Uh, I, I'm not sure what drives me, but I'm from, in Australia, I'm from a, you know, not, not one of the big cities. I'm from Perth in Western mm -hmm. Australia, which is very much um, kind of a, a, a third or fourth city in Australia. Um, and it wasn't often that uh, people from that city were successful in advertising, certainly not internationally. Right. So I kind of said to myself very early on, uh, you know, I set these goals for myself. Um, one was that I wanted to, I thought the biggest goal was to work in Sydney and that's uh, what I did early on and then I decided I wanted to work internationally. Um, and I guess uh, for me a moment that uh, really kind of summed up uh, when I didn't ask for permission, I just went for it, was uh, I decided, uh, I guess through a combination of ambition and Catholic guilt, that I wanted to be a creative director by the time I was 30. And I was 27 at the time. And and that that's pretty young to be running an agency, and I and I, I don't know why I set this goal for myself, but I just did, and uh, and I started sort of shaping myself into what I think a creative director should be, and how they should behave, and how they should dress, and all of that. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, I got an interview uh, with M and C Saatchi in Australia. They were opening a new office in Melbourne, and. The truth is I'd really never done a lot of the things that, that an executive creative director of an agency does. You know, I actually hadn't personally led a pitch, although I'd been involved in lots of pitches. Uh, I'd never employed anyone. You know, I'd, I'd never done a performance review, none of that sort of stuff. But I kind of just bullshitted my way through it. And when, <laughs> and when they said, you know, well, what's your experience doing pitches? Oh, you know, I've done pitches. <laughs> uh, you know. um, and because I knew I could do it, and I'd seen people do it, and I was like, I can do that. Right. Um, and I thought, if I sit back and wait for them to decide that I'm ready, they'll never give me this opportunity. I know I'm ready, I just need to jump in and do so it. So it's kind of fire and then aim. Yeah, right. yeah. And so, you know, I, I, I went through about three months of interviewing for that first job, and it was really interesting, because uh, after three months, they said to me, uh, look, we're gonna pass, we don't, think that you know you're you're ready for this job i'm i'm about four months off my 30th birthday at this stage and i'm like oh, gotta get to that goal. I, I have to do this so i sent them an email and said give me one more chance to come in and speak to you and i will convince you why i'm the right person for this i'm sorry i thought nothing to lose may as well um so i went back in and just sort of de dived into the depths of my passion and belief of why I could do this job. And then within about 20 minutes, they were like, okay, all right, yep, you can do it. And You've what got... do you think convinced them? It was your passion? I think it was it the was passion, the... yeah. Um, I mean, I think they knew I was young. Uh, you know, I didn't have anywhere near the amount of gray hair then. Um, you know, I, I looked like a baby. Um, but they, I think they saw my passion and thought, when sort of pointed in the right direction, then I'll be able to achieve what they want me to achieve. Okay, that's great. We'll get, there's so much in that story that I think we can pull out drive and, and um, the chutzpah it takes to just say, let me convince you. And I'm sure it's not just passion. You probably have very good pitching abilities too. So we'll get into all that good stuff later. Um, so I'm very interested in the psychology of risk taking and going out on the limb like this bird that you were talking about and the innate ability to do so. So I'd like to go back to the, um, your experiences as children. Um, I grew up in Ames, Iowa, so I was one of the only Asians in the small town, and so I relate to your story, Vizila. And so I'm curious for you: was there anything that really helped hone this ability to not, in in essence, care about what anyone thinks of you? You know, there's an you get made fun of, right? I, I'm sure you and I have that in common, yeah. and um, you're made of, fun of of something that's so you, and that you take it so personally, and you don't know as a young child how to handle racist comments, right? So I'm assuming that we both rose above it and said, I don't care what you think of me. In fact, I'm going to use this experience to be my secret weapon to be able to accomplish whatever I want to accomplish. So I'd like to hear from your vantage point what that was for you and how you were able to cultivate these qualities. Um, 
I was born 41 years ago in Spain, in Valencia, where there was not Africans over there. So um, the first day of school for me was very hard because also I have a name, Bisila Bococo, and all the kids I remember they threw in the, in the floor laughing when they put the list in the class. And I remember I came one day home a little bit sad and I told to my parents, you know, they call me black in the school. And my father told me, look in the mirror. You know, I'm sorry? Look in the mirror. Mm -hmm. And he said, you're going to have to deal in life with that, that you're black and you're a woman. So the, be, do the best of yourself. So I think that my parents always encouraged me to embrace who I was. So at a certain point, I think when I was a teenager, I realized that I have two choices, or always feel different or feel special. Mm -hmm. So I choose to mm -hmm. feel special. So I love that. That's so extraordinary. So you can choose to be either different or special, and you, chose, you felt like you were special. Okay. And that's I what that. I, I think that was my drive through my career, to always feel special and try to find the best inside of myself to put it out. Mm -hmm. And this is really what has been pretty much my path. Right. And don't fear who you are and present yourself. And, even in my world, I'm the only one in most of the, um, in, in, because I, I work a lot with different European companies and I work in fields that are dominated by different races or sexes, but I, I just mm -hmm. feel myself. Right. And even, I, I feel that even when you walk into the room, you really own it and you have the presence and I'm sure that your childhood has really helped I think cultivate those qualities in you. Yeah. Um, so Nicole and I bonded on Sunday night over child rearing secrets that she was <laughs> passing on to me. I have a sassy six-year-old and Nicole has a daughter that she, um, what they were bonding here in New York City while she's here. And you said something very interesting, if you don't mind, that I share. Uh -huh. And it had to do with, don't try to control your child because, and that's as if I know many of you must be parents, that's uh, easier said than done. And that's how you really help cultivate a great relationship, but yeah. also their individuality. Yeah. Um, I think um, what happens with, with uh, managers, but also um, you know, even parents, what, is that you stifle their true personality out of them by saying, you know, well, I, um, you do as I say, and, and, and you're, you're under my roof, and I'm your father, and all of those things, without actually letting them experience that they need to mess up, because you're, you're trying to mollycoddle them. Mm -hmm. And I find that micromanagement of, um, so there was a time throughout my career where people have tried to micromanage me, mm -hmm. uh, and it just doesn't work because I, am, I have enough self-esteem, and I think self-esteem is a big thing with being fearless and being brave, is that you, you need to yourself believe, do you know what, I don't need to work late tonight. I really feel that I've worked enough and I've done enough, and so self-esteem I think is really important, not, control, not being controlled or, um, or controlling people mm -hmm. is really important, to allow people to mess up and find their own way. Mm -hmm. And I think with me, I think a lot of it also is to do mm -hmm. with how you're wired. Um, I, I asked all of my, the lab team to do um, emotional intelligence testing and Myers-Briggs testing, because then you can work out, you can play to people's strengths. So some people, you know, I really love going to events where I know no one and I know nothing. And somebody else would hate doing that. So try putting them in that space and ask them to go to an event and know no one and nothing. They'll, they'll, it, it won't be right to their personality. So once you know your personality, then you know your strengths, then you can build on your self-esteem. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, so things, and then you'll know that you're not perfect. Right. Because there's things that I'm crap at like speaking to management, I speak a different language. I speak, you know, the language of the people. Um, and management is a whole other Russian, another language. But Gemma, who works in my team, who is a science and a maths major and she codes and she's 25, right. she's amazing at speaking that shit. I can't. <laughs> That's not a strength of mine. That's why I keep butting up against them. Right. So you just find people's strengths that then empowers them because mm -hmm. they think, oh, I'm good at that. Yeah. Right. And that's what I think is quite important. 
And you're using a lot of great words like micromanage and um, earlier used another M word that I'll get to in just a second. And it has all to do with managing a team. Not and my how swear you, words. Then. You're using none a lot. No, none of the swear words, but the, the M words were all good. Um, so Jimmy or, or Matt, did you want to add to the childhood aspect of well, what may have shaped? Yeah, more than the childhood is, uh, is I have a 11 year old daughter and, uh, and a nine year old boy. It's, for me, it's similar concept. It's, is that um, I, I, I tend to, to really personally and to my team and to my family is to, to go and, and let them find a path of least resistance um, mm, in, in to, in to, in to move to their aspirations. There is a difference between aspiration and ambition. And that is very important for, for me, I believe, uh, for anybody who's fine, uh, looking for aspiration. Ambition, in a way, is a goal-oriented. You imagine where you want to be. I want to become this, win that, do this. And it's just fake. It's a fake. Did you say too. mission? Ambition, Ambition versus aspiration. Right. Aspiration is a goal in life. It's something unachievable. And it's something, I, I, I call it almost like the sun in front of you. What you really came to this life to do. And it's important to know what it is and to be clear of that, to feel it, not necessarily to know it. Because inevitably there's conditions. There's going to be rain, there's going to be fog, there's going to be you know, clouds. But if you know where the sun is, you can close your eyes, move around, and you will always know where it is. So you continue plowing through, true to, your, to that uh, aspiration. And eventually the millions of millions of micro decisions that you make by just the fact of living will get you there. That is simple as that. And this aspiration is clear. You don't care about the no-sayers that say, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. Because you know, and that is a little bit the, the, the key, when, when somehow you choose to understand that versus, and then I think that's the first thing that we all need to do, is just to really be clear what that aspiration is. So and how do you teach that, for example, to, do you have a story that you can share of how you taught that to your Well, it's, uh, there's, uh, I always say there's a mentor of mine, that I never met him yet, uh, but he's the founder and president of Patagonia. It's a book that I recommend, it's Let My People Go Surfing. And that is a little bit of how we do it in, 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 in our office. It's an entrepreneurial place, a very amazing change of the industry. We're all a bunch of uh, multidisciplinary group of uh, creative craft men and women that are refining the industry. And our point of view is refining the industry. And, and the way to do that is by really uh, let my people go surfing is a, is a management mindset of a, your role as a manager is to clean the path, plain and simple. The role of the people that you manage is to enter into that path or to enter into that door. But your role is to make sure that that path is clean based on the natural flow of their, aspira their aspiration. So that's a, that's a very, almost like a compassionate leadership, inclusive leadership, all those things that what you need to work is your ass off is in your own ego as a creative, is to allow that to happen. And no, that's not the way that we need to, this is to the, the path of controlling it. So I think the industry is in a complete revolution. No, it's faster than that. There is an old, and there is the one that is being formed right now. And I think it's a great opportunity right now for the industry to understand that diversity is not just a cute thing. Mm -hmm. It's the sharpest knife in the drawer. Mm -hmm. It's inevitably important to have diversity in the teams in order to enter into the complex world that we are. Without diversity, just, just basically. I, I think this word in a company, you need your, your naughty one. Like, it's me in my company. Um, the, not, the naughty the one. The naughty one. It sounds so much better when, with your accent. Yeah. And so when you've got someone who's um, fearless and naughty, and you almost like a bit of a Pied Piper, and, and I kind of send a note round saying anyone wants to get involved in the next lab day and, and there's maybe about a dozen people put their hand up because they know they have permission to just do what the hell they want. And giving them that um, releasing control. And I had one girl, she was really panicking and, and she needed to see me urgently. I'm like, well, just come in, the door's always open. She yeah. said, you know, I don't, want, I don't know what to do with the, the design of the lanyard. So I said, well, well, what do you want? What do you like? So she said, well, I like this because I went, great, go for it. 
it, it takes away that angst yeah. of them feeling so frightened to move an inch. You find that person within an organisation who will take any kind of blame um, for them. So if, if they mess up on something, I'll take the hit. Because really, what's the worst again that's going to happen? But once they then, by the end of the lab, like semester, six months, they are different people. Oh my God, they're kick ass. Yeah. And I, I haven't would, made them. Uh, yes, and I have a very important for, question for you. I just want to make sure, did you have anything you wanted to add before we get into the um, next I, question? I guess uh, one of the things that's interesting, and you said it, uh, and, I, and uh, you know, a couple of people oh, have yeah. said it, um, the, the idea of uh, being a young person facing some kind of adversity, whether it's being, you know, Asian growing up in a place that doesn't have a lot of Asian people or, you know, a black person in a country that doesn't. Um, for me, you know, I, I grew up as a gay man and, and I felt that at school that I got teased because of that. Um, and I think when I finally got out of school, uh, it gave, I sort of found a whole new permission to be the person I really was. Mm -hmm. And I think that that may be something about that environment of, of being kind of pushed and put down and, and makes you realise, you know what, screw it. I, I have to come and be who I am and I have to be louder than everyone else and I have to really stand up if I'm going to be noticed. And you have to be more you. You have to, yeah. And I think, I, I definitely think, I mean, I'm sure there's not a point in your life where you go, all right, I admit it, I'm Asian. I think that was probably obvious from the start. <laughs> but, but I think for me, that sort of process definitely gave me the confidence to start achieving the things in my life that I wanted to achieve without having that uh, burden, I think. Yeah, so. it gives you the balls to yeah, do what you want yeah, in many ways, exactly. yes. Okay, so my big question to you, and I'd love for you to define the word micromanage. What is micromanage to you? As, as we're, cult we're talking a lot about cultivating teens, how do you show up as leader you want to be to, as you, I thought you said, el said it so eloquently, Jimmy, um, to pave the way mm. for your team? Um, I had an experience, again, that it goes back to self-esteem, that one thing is the most important um, with, with especially pushing boundaries, um, or a life, I think, in general. But I had an experience with um, a CEO who I was working with uh, who inherited me, which obviously <laughs> is not going to be, is going to be a bit difficult for some people. Some people embrace it, some people not so much. So she decided to put a couple of henchmen um, in charge of digital, which meant that they would be in charge of labs, or, or so they thought. Obviously, that was not going to happen. Um, and so that was kind of quashed immediately. And then I just thought, okay, let's just have a very honest conversation. And I just um, went up to her and I just said, I'm just going to have a really honest conversation, regardless of how, what the outcome is, and be prepared to walk if I had to walk. But the conversation was, I am not like you. I don't want your job. I don't want to go up through the ranks. Um, up this greasy pole. I don't want a million people <laughs> reporting into me. I don't, I'm not driven by money. I'm driven by freedom and anonymity. And you give me those things and you get out of my backside and stop, you know, with the control, with putting people in, you know, I've got to do PowerPoint presentations and client meetings. That's not my strength. My strength is special needs kind of over here. I know that. I'm now telling you that's my strength and I'll make magic happen for you if you just listen to what I'm saying. And that honest conversation was, was just a, a, a breath of fresh air to just be able to then breathe and do what I do best. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so um, what is micromanaging though for you? It's where, it's where someone's trying to control you or say you've got to go and do this which makes, it's, it's like being a teenager actually, where a parent says black and you say white. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's exactly that. It's, well, well, why do I have to do that? And I think said? the disappointing thing about micromanaging is I, ne I think you never quite get to see what that person is capable of because you're kind of giving them the instruction yeah. and say, do this without knowing what they can actually do. Um, when I was at DDB, uh, there was a, one of the values of the company was the freedom to be. Mm -hmm. um, which is a fantastic kind of mantra for people to uh, be who you want to be, try the things you want to try. Um, and so for me, I've always been the opposite of micromanaging is I want to push people to do things they're not even sure they were capable of doing and see if they can do it. Um, and I think people get so much uh, joy out of discovering, wow, I, yeah. I, I had never imagined I could do that. And they do it and they 
grow and they learn and they walk a little bit taller. And I think, you know, that's because I've let them take a risk themselves in a protected environment that will, you know, if they fail, they're okay. Right. So You know, I have to admit that, uh, so I'm, I'm not breaking out in hives by any means right now, but I, I, this conversation is very interesting to me because as a pianist, there are certain... The, rules. Uh, rules of standards and excellence where you practice, like I said, to color in the lines and then the magic is when you can let go. Um, and then now as an entrepreneur and the boss of people, you know, hearing things like, just let them be who they want to be. Yeah. You know, it, it's a little bit of a um, conundrum for me. So uh, do you... So, no, I just want to say, because, you know, micromanagement is, I, I sometimes see micromanagement as a archaic fear. You know, mm -hmm. but we all are micromanagers in a way. It's almost like a, we, we may say that we let them free, but there is a, a little bit of, it's almost a practice. It's almost like a walking a racer's edge. You constantly have to be wet, watch out with that because you can easily be one, no? Right. Because you sometimes have to say that is wrong, that is right. As a leader, you have to somehow figure out where to go. And I'm saying that, that, that we, we are all, all, all in that process of, uh, of understanding. So one thing that I, I say is that we are moving in, from a complicated reductionist world where, you know, complicated, I always say to my team, is that complicated was create a, a, design a turbine engine. That's what it was in 1950s, where, you know, you can take that piece and do a, 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 um, a manual for it and you have people doing it and there's a, a way of understanding the whole thing that you're doing. But today we're in a complex world which is complicated and uncertain. uncertain. So nobody really is enough intelligently, it has the enough intelligence to understand everything. So you have to really let it flow, be permeable to really understand. In, so micromanagement in a complex world is one of the most dangerous thing a leader can be. That's why I think it's an archaic fear of any leader to control and to be there in order to continue bubble in the in in a in a or a corporation ladder, if you will. Right. So it's a so it's I a think there's a there's spread. a um, struggle. There, I think what I'm hearing is there's this fine line between guidance and mentorship and control. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure you have some thoughts to share on this well, as well. Well, I, I agree with. Uh, Jimmy, that I mean, all of us. When you have, you are a leader, and you have a goal, you want to get there, and obviously, you need to let your team to bring themselves the best of themselves. But they need guidance, and this is your role to just be sure that the direction that things are taking is the direction, the way you want to go. So I think also, it's important to trust. I think that the key word is trust, yes. because when you are in the that process to develop. Yeah a team, you have to trust them. And sometimes you have to let them take decisions. And maybe they're not the right decisions. Um, personally, in my case, I don't really care so much about how they do it. It's just to get there. So we have certain goals. We have deadlines. We have things to do. And I just want them done and right. Mm, right. And people have different ways to do it. And when you let them do it, and you trust them. Yes. So that you goes might be surprised <laughs> yeah. about how maybe your way is not the perfect way and you get to the same point. So that goes along the lines of what you were saying, Jimmy, that, that there's a shared aspiration and how you get there may not be as important as getting there, whatever yeah. there is. Not everyone um, can be like this, can, can take those risks or not ask permission because that's not how they're wired. So it, it's finding the people in your organizations where that's a skill of theirs and giving them a little rope to go do it. Um, and, and I think once those people know they have a bit of rope, because it's not going to be every, otherwise it's anarchy. Employ millions of me, it, obviously, it will be anarchy. <laughs> Especially within a large organization, which is very process driven. Right. Um, people like me are, I guess, unemployable. Uh, I, I've managed to make it work because I know the industry quite well and I deliver. And I think that's the, that's the thing with this kind of personality. It's quite an entrepreneurial personality to not ask for permission. But I, I would like to ask a question on that because, you know, we always debate on this. Leadership is born or you are created. Mm. So it's like, are we all in this room have the same capacity to lead and to be a creative powerhouse or no? Some of you are born with it, some are, bo are born without it. 
That's what I struggle now, because I am clear that we're all exactly the same. That we have all, that's, that's why I'm saying that there is a, a dis discussion here. Yeah. I do believe that everybody is exactly perfect the same and has that same ability, but you're covered with a bunch of layers of your existence, your environment, and you just have to find that within you and to let it, let it come out. But some other people believe that people are wired in a certain way. So yeah, I mean, Seth Godin did a really interesting blog post called Hunters and Farmers. Um, and I thought that was really, you know, go check it out. It, it's very interesting in the, in the different levels of personalities. But obviously there will be layers. There's a, a, we do a, um, a future talent thing at the labs called um, Rough Diamond. And we take mm -hmm. kids in from age 14 um, into Ogilvy and, and um, from Greenwich, Tower Hamlets and Hackney, really, you know, not privileged areas at all, and show them a world that they could potentially work in. They think their future is a Tesco's checkout. One of the lessons we do with, with these 14-year-olds is we take them out for lunch. I know it sounds really ridiculous, but a lot of them will maybe have just gone to Nando's or not necessarily even eaten with knives and forks. But when we go out for lunch, you then start to get deeper into the kid and you start to find out, you know, break through their layers. And one of the girls, Benedictine, was from the Congo. So she spoke Congolese, six languages, Congolese, wow. Spanish, French, English. But because she was failing in English, um, the teachers were constantly naughty, naughty girl. And she felt crap about herself. We were like, oh my God, you're a bloody genius. You can do this, 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 <laughs> this. From that moment on, this girl has just gone like that just from going out for lunch. Mm -hmm. And I think you're sort of pointing to something else, that there is a lot of cultural differences in terms of uh, what we're talking about as well. I mean, I'm lucky in that I spend a fair bit of time traveling around the world. Uh, I just spoke at a conference in Korea recently, and I was talking to them about curiosity and courage. Mm. And it's really interesting because that's a culture that actually yeah. uh, kind of really pushes down the idea of curiosity. You're not meant to ask why, mm -hmm. you know, you're meant to agree. And, and courage is, is discouraged there. <laughs> um, and, and that's not the only place in the world. So I think, uh, you know, allowing uh, within, I think that's why we, diversity is so important mm. because not everyone can tap readily into those skills. Right. Um, and for some, it's, it's a cultural barrier that they're, then they have to ask permission for everything they do. Um, they, you know, uh, Japan is similar, you know, like they, they don't like to argue. They don't like to say no. So they say yes, when they're really what they mean is no. So yes. I think finding ways to adapt yeah. that kind of spirit to cultures that aren't as open as, you know, the United States is. Part. Yes. And so one seed I'd love to explore before we take questions. And by the way, if you do have questions, please come. Is there a video here that they need to have the audience members up here asking questions or they can ask from the audience? They can ask from the audience. So if you have questions, jot them down because we're going to get them answered in the last 10 minutes here. Um, but I think for the, those who are not the uh, beautiful leaders you are right now and they're climbing the ranks, I think your story is very inspirational of how you just went in there and you're like, come on, I'm the right person for this job. And, those moments where you can really get to the next level in your career, how can these people just get to that next level? So what I want to get into that because I think the drive that you exhibited and the risk that you took, how, what was the recipe there? I mean, I think the biggest thing, and it's, it's people of, I've been lucky enough to work in agencies and work on a transformation of those agencies. And people have said to me, what's the most common thing you do? And the most common thing I do is become a cheerleader and I become a cheerleader and support the people that work around me and make them believe that they can do it. And I think you have to do that for yourself. You have to be your own cheerleader and convince yourself, you know, it's, it's almost trite, but you know, you, you hear stories about, look in the mirror every day and say your affirmations. I am great, I am beautiful. <laughs> what is, but, but there's something about that self voice in your head that when you say to yourself, I can be successful, I deserve the success, that helps you achieve it. If you're talking yourself out of it the whole time, then it's unlikely that you're ever going to get it. So I think as, as a leader, it's my job to be the cheerleader and help everyone believe they can be, yeah. go beyond what they've achieved and do even more. And, and I think the same thing for myself. And what, what do you look for in talent? What is it that makes you say, oh my gosh, that person's the next me? 
Well, ne the I never, next leader. Oh, yeah. Okay. Because I, <laughs> the, the next me is a. Um, it, well, no. It's, no it's, new Jimmy. No, oh, it's yeah. like. It's a, it, the next it, leader that can it, really. Well, get I, one, one of the things, I mean, by, by the way, one of the, our values in, in Edelman is the courage to be always cur curious. Uh, it's a very beautiful va value that we drive. Uh, it's, it, one of the things that I, I do uh, encourage is this I, ability of, of um, I, and I know I'm a creative leader, one of the creative leaders, but I am also very spiritual in the way that I lead the, the agency because uh, I was also struck by the blue marble, the picture of the planet completely lit in 1972. Uh, which was the year that I was born, I found out later that. And I, it, it gave me a sense of finite, this little rock suspended in space, I live there. All the big, bad, war, stupidity that we are seeing ourselves. We, as a creative, uh, a, a creative layer, have the ability to persuade billions of people to change from one soap to another one while the house is on fire. When there's global warming, biodiversity, gender stupidity, I mean, it's like inequality of stupidity, you know? So I, I guess what I'm saying to, to my team is life is a second. What are you waiting for? You know, and if you start to allow into that finite sense of life, the, the ephemerous nature of it, when you start seeing the people around you that die suddenly and all the stuff, and then you don't be fearful of that, but just saying like, this is it, this is it. What are we doing with it? You know, what are we doing with that? And in that moment, I can see that sense of like, I am going to just jump and do that. And sometimes it's like, Jimmy, you're so right. I am going to go to a Peace Corps. No, stay here. I'm going to open my yoga studio. No. But they leave, okay, the agency. But the ones that they don't and stay in the agency uh, are amazing. They become a leader very quickly. So it's kind of like uh, a puppy that you just have to throw into the water and they're gonna just swim, right? I think so. Go in there, take the duck, don't even think about it, just do it. There's a great two minute film with, um, again, look it up on, um, on YouTube, a guy called Paul Crick. And, um, and it, it literally, it's about one or two minutes and he just, it's him facing the camera, camera and he just says, this is it, fuck it. It is what it is. <laughs> this is it. And if you apply that actually to most things, it, it, it's quite simple, simple in its thought process to just think, I'll just go for it. Right, and I liked what you said earlier, what's the worst that could happen, yeah. really? What's the worst that could happen? Well, you can lose your job, but you'll get another one. But Easier there, said than done. There, but is there such a thing as job security these days anyway, right? So if you lose one, there's yeah. maybe a no. better opportunity for you, but right? Also, I like what you said, like, what do you look for? How can you tell? Yeah, um, and I what are think, the traits? I, I mean, for me, and you've already said it, but I think it's passion. I think mm -hmm. that's what I look for. I think talent is a common commodity. And I think there's a lot of talented people and, you know, particularly, uh, you know, we're in New York City where a lot of people are drawn and there's, so there's a lot of great people here. Agree with that. But the ones that are the most successful are the ones that are the most passionate, mm -hmm. I think. And often talented people fall by the wayside because they don't have the passion to succeed when something knocks them down, when they get a no or whatever. So I know when I interview is I very much look for, are you passionate in your life? Right. I don't care, like, obviously you've got to this point because you're good at what you do. Do, do, you, feel, do you feel that that passion, you see it in, in, in people who are clear on their, their drive, their aspiration to go? I, I think it comes out if, you, if, you, if I uh, meet someone and I'm interviewing them and they're an incredibly passionate baker and they, they write a blog about baking, then I'm like, that's a passionate person that has passion. Maybe it's not about advertising yet, but I can move that yes, passion. And absolutely. So I just look for passion in anything. Like if you're into photography, if you're into renovating houses, whatever it might be. And I think to me, that's the biggest clue of they could be a leader. That's interesting. I, I love that. And I think, you know, you talked about rejection. You know, success is really born out of rejection. And if you have the passion and the aspiration to, to if that's bigger, that's the thing then you're going to happen. Ego, yeah. you know. Okay, let's take some questions. Yes, over there. Can you say your name and where you're from? Yes, my name's Amanda. I'm actually, I work at Edelman in Toronto. Um, this is a question for Jimmy. Hi, uh, how are you? Uh, I wonder if you could speak uh, specifically about a time when you didn't ask permission from a client and you spotted a creative opportunity and acted on it and how that went. 
Uh, well, yes, I have that all the time. Uh, we all do. The thing is, the thing is, is, is a matter of, uh, you know, will I am, will I am, will I am, said something that I, to me once that I thought it was interesting in one of our meetings. He said, like, he transformed the, the concept of no to no with a K-N-O. So I thought, oh, yeah, yeah. So it is like when a client say no, you just have to understand exactly why he's saying no and then transform it. So how many times to us that we present to a client an idea and three months after we just change the same idea and change the way that we present that idea and the client says, yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> so I, I think it's just a matter of, it, it's a constant uh, when clients are not ready, especially clients are not ready for what Edelman is really doing, this idea of communication marketing, this idea of earned-centric ideas that, that takes a life of its own, you know? So it's a very uh, new thing for, for them. So we just have to uh, constantly understand why they say no and then put the data that supports it, put a, a clear understanding going out to dinner with them. I don't do that too much, but that is, uh, <laughs> that is more uh, what I find for the creative side is that the client strategist, the client lead are the key for that because that they develop the trust with the client enough for that idea to be reshaped and presented back again. Let me, can I just pull out what I heard there and then we can, yep. we know you, you have, you're passionate to say something too. Um, what I heard is that the ability to really present your idea is key. It's it, the it's passion key. The to way, present The way again. you presented to, to get that job yeah. was key. Yeah. No. But I don't even ask for them to say no because the world that I live in with everything being new and it's never been done before, it's really hard to eloquently express your vision. Correct. So therefore, you can say it and then they'll say no, but what I do actually is prove by doing, which is why the, you know, don't wait for, mi for permission is really important. So I just think, do you know what? I'm not even gonna discuss it. I'm just gonna go underground, get it done, um, tell no one. And then as I come up, normally what happens is I go, see? And they go, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, most of the time. Mm -hmm. If there's Very any time too. where there's any kind of backlash, I just say, oh, didn't you see that email that I sent you? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and I think bottom line, clients really want to be led, you know, yeah. and that kind of conviction is true leadership. Absolutely. Did you want to there's say a, that? There's a great, no, um, go back. Right. there's a great TED talk called No, 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 Yes. And the premise of it is that every no is followed by a comma. It's not no, it's no comma, but if yeah. you did this. And, and I think that's what you're saying is, yeah, clients say no all the time, but they always give you a little opening to go, we don't like it because of this. And you go, all right, I can fix that. And then you get no comma again. And I think that's the thing. And that's where passion comes in because there's going to be four no's, five no's before you get the yes. There are so many book titles that have been thrown out in this conversation <laughs> alone from uh, courage to be curious to no to comma no, whatever. Um, a lot of creativity up here. Another question. Yeah. There is a question over there. It's, this is for Nicole. Um, I, I think it's fascinating that you oh, use right. um, the emotional intelligence tests in the Myers-Briggs yeah. on your team. Do you, have you found like the perfect formula of ENFPs and yeah. I, INFPs and how, how to create that perfect group? What was so weird, I did a leadership uh, course um, for the last 10 months, which was bizarre, but I was the only ENFP. Everyone else around me was, uh, was, was different, which I found quite interesting, in that the hiring perhaps goes to hiring like-minded people, not random lunatics, perhaps like ENFPs. Um, but I think it, it's no different to say the Edward de Bono hats. It's all part and parcel of have, there's no wrong or right. They're, they're just different opinions, different ways of seeing things. Um, and what, when things get heated and arguments are when someone feels that, you know, well, I'm right. There isn't a right or wrong. It's just being able to understand um, someone else's point of view that leads you to a different place. And, and so that's what I found with, with my group is that we all have different strengths and weaknesses. And if there's something that actually should be done by me, but actually the better result would be with Gemma or Shannon, then I, I, will, I push them forward. As, as a leader, I will say, no, you're much, much better, smarter um, at doing this than I am. 
And I think that's, that's it. It's knowing as a leader that your strengths and your weaknesses, are, are because there isn't a perfection, you can't show yourself to be perfect. You need to embrace vulnerability and, and have people see that you're human. Um, we have one minute left. So I thought what we could do is end with your, either your favorite quote or just a pearl of wisdom in a tweet, because we only have time for, it's gotta be a tweet. All right, mine is, um, I love this saying, I'm, I'm humble enough to know I'm no better than anyone else, but I'm wise enough to know I'm different. Mm, love that. So. Endings could be beautiful beginnings. Wonderful, I love that. Well, quotes. I would just say, not a quote, but something with the emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. It's going to be more important that intellectual. Yes. Uh, the IP, EQ, EP is going to be more <laughs> important than IP in the near future, or if it's not today. Um, I have a poster on my wall which is kind of my mantra, and it's simple. It just says, work hard and be nice to people. Mm, I love that. And so thank you so much. Thank you to Matt for that yes. last minute. Break the rules. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. It was nice.